Good morning. For our Bible study this morning, we're going to... Does everybody have a copy of the 19-minute Bible study sheet on the parable of the ten virgins? We're going to do this as our Bible study because it's right in line with the theme for this, the first Sunday of Advent. And why don't we, before we get started by going into God's word together, let's begin with prayer. We pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love, your love that prompted you to give up your own son for his first Advent arrival, his coming into the world in humility in Bethlehem. We thank you for his humiliation revealed on the cross when he died for us and the comfort that we have in knowing that all of our sin has been washed away forever. We praise your holy name. We also thank you for the coming of your Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives by bringing us to faith. Keep us in this faith so that we always look to you and watch for your coming and are ready for that great and glorious day when you come again. Bless our Bible study and keep us in this grace today and always for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Therefore, keep watch is really the theme for this Bible study. Today is the first Sunday in Advent. You'll notice that if you think back several years, we had a different color on the altar during the season of Advent. Do you remember what that color was? Purple. It was purple, uh, which is the same color as what season of the church year? Lent. Anybody know what the focus or message is of purple in the church? Yeah, royalty and repentance. Royalty, pointing us to Christ, the humble king, and penitent hearts that are prepared for Christ. Blue, which is a sharp-looking color. Blue, what is that message? Okay, what, 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 what color, or what thing in the world stands out when you think of the color blue? Sky. The sky. And that's really why blue is blue for the, this time of the year. It draws our eyes to the sky with the anticipation and the hope of heavenly things. The anticipation and the hope of Christ's return. Both focuses of Advent are good. Repentance, anticipation, but blue brings out the anticipation aspect. The hope. And we just answered that question. See, this is the problem of not having the question in front of me. I forget what question I intended to ask. <laughs> what do we mean by the coming of Christ? In other words, what is that coming? And has that coming happened yet? Okay, there you go. So we're, there's several comings of Christ, or arrivals of Christ. The first coming of Christ was when? Christmas. When he came in Bethlehem, born in the manger, or laid sleeping in the manger, resting in the manger, born in a stable, born of the virgin, that's his first arrival in humiliation as a humble savior. His second coming will be when? You can't say when, but will be what event? The last day. The last day when he comes again in glory. And that, the difference there is he will be fully exalted and every eye will see him. Does Christ come to us in a third way? Yeah, he comes to us every time we hear his word through word and sacrament. He continually comes to us and fills our hearts and speaks to us and guides us and encourages us and draws us closer to him. But Advent is that Latin word that means coming, his arrival. Let's read now from Matthew 25, 1 to 13, and I'll read the italicized portion first and then we'll read God's word. The phrase kingdom of heaven often refers to God's glorious kingdom in the world to come, but the term is also used to refer to God's kingdom here on earth, 
where he graciously rules by faith in human hearts and lives. In the following parable, Jesus teaches how the members of God's kingdom on earth will prepare themselves for the end of the world. And now I'll read from the sheet. Jesus said, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. And I'm forgetting to scroll the screen. I'm so used to somebody in worship doing it for me that I forgot I have this in my hand. Later, the, other, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Sorry about forgetting to scroll the screen. It doesn't take long to get out of the pattern of doing things a certain way. In Jesus' day, there was a religious ceremony of a betrothal which legally bound the couple together as man and wife. Weeks or months later, the bridegroom went to the house of the bride in order to bring her to his home. The bride's attendants, the virgins, went out to meet the groom and escort him to the bride. They took their lamps to light the way and to provide festive lights for the happy occasion. So that, that was the, the cultural way that weddings were done then. You were legally married when you were betrothed, but you weren't yet together as husband and wife. That's why in the Christmas account, even though Mary and Joseph were not living together in the same place and not yet had a relationship as husband and wife, when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, what was Joseph going to do? Divorce her. Divorce her quietly. Because they had already been legally betrothed. But it wasn't until the public ceremony of the wedding that they then lived together in the same place as husband and wife. And so Jesus' parable of the ten virgins is in line with the cultural way weddings were done there at that time. That they were already betrothed and then the bridegroom would come. And then the bride would be escorted out to the bridegroom by the bridesmaids, or the attendants, or the virgins. Number one, in what ways were the ten virgins in Jesus' parable alike? They were all virgins. Okay, they were all virgins or attendants. Yes. They were all bridesmaids. So you had ten bridesmaids. Any other ways that they were alike? They were all waiting for the bridegroom, so they were there for a reason. They were gathered together at the place of the bride, the house of the bride, waiting for the groom to arrive. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. Any other similarities that they had? They all had lamps. They all had lamps. And as bridesmaids, uh, keep in mind, weddings were a big deal then, because marriage is a big deal. Marriage is a big deal. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about marriage, by the way. Without digressing too much, um, marriage has always been a big deal, and marriage has always been downplayed by society. Always. Every, every time in culture and society, there has been struggles with downplaying marriage. And... 
the reason for that, why do you think society tends to downplay how important marriage is? That's what, and that's what has happened. And society can downplay marriage. Like at the time of Martin Luther, they were downplaying marriage by telling people don't get married. The priests weren't allowed to get married. That was downplaying marriage, right? And marriage is downplayed when it becomes more about the wedding ceremony than the marriage itself. And the reason why marriage tends to get downplayed is because Satan wants it to be downplayed. Because if marriage is downplayed and put down, you're attacking the core of family. You're attacking the, the whole, the unit, the essence of the home. And that's why Satan really does target that. And the marriage celebration at the time of Jesus was an event. And it actually added to the sacred event of marriage that the betrothal was an expression of the commitment and yet they waited until it was public, until it was made known to all. And that added to the sacredness of the marriage foundation. And so when the groom did arrive, that was a very big deal. And the bridesmaids and the attendants, they were dressed up. They were wearing their best dresses and clothing in preparation to celebrate that day. And remember, the marriage feast lasted a while. Remember how Jesus attended the wedding at Cana? And they had that problem? Lack of wine. They ran out of wine. And Jesus addressed that, but most of all, he addressed it by showing how awesome he is by doing something only God can do. So they, what did they have in common? They were all bridesmaids. They were virgins. They were dressed similarly. They all had lamps. They were all waiting. Although similar in many ways, what made five of them foolish and five wise? Preparation. Okay, the preparation. And what was, in the parable Jesus tells, what was the indicator of being ready or prepared? Oil. The oil. The oil. Having oil on hand because they knew the bridegroom was going to arrive. What didn't they know? What time? When. They didn't know when, but they knew he would. <clears throat> Number two, the five foolish virgins were not allowed to enter the wedding banquet because, which one is correct? Because number one, they were not as pure as the wise virgins. Or because number two, they were absent-minded. Or because number three, they were too cheap to buy their own oil. Or because number four, they were not prepared. Number four, they were not prepared. Unless they were not prepared, not because of absent-mindedness, but because they just didn't care. I won't need it. I won't need it. Number three, in Jesus' parable, whom do the bridegroom, or who's the bridegroom? Jesus. The bridegroom is Jesus. Who are the virgins? Us, the world, us. What do the wedding banquet, what does the wedding banquet and midnight represent? Second. Yep, the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ. And we're going to talk about this a little bit, but the fact that it's called a wedding banquet tells us something about the coming of Christ from the perspective of those who are prepared, right? <laughs> and I think that's coming up, it, it is coming up very soon. Number four, what is the oil that makes someone prepared to enter the heavenly banquet? Faith. faith. It is faith. And why can't the oil be shared? Personal for everybody. I'm sorry, what? Personal for everybody. Yeah. Uh, we can't believe for anyone else. As much as we might like to, and as much as people maybe in our lives wanted to for us at times, you can't believe for anyone else. Each person, when Jesus returns or when we die, each person will stand before God individually, right? 
Each person will stand before God individually. And that's why it's imperative that each individual person is prepared to stand before God. And what again is it that makes a person prepared to meet their God? Faith. Faith. And we'll talk more about this too. Number five, after reading the following passage, explain the words of Christ, who is the omniscient bridegroom, to those without oil. As, G as he says, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. But before we read the passage, we have to define the word omniscient. Who can define the word omniscient? All-knowing. 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 Omni-science. All-knowledge. All-knowing. Matthew 10. Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. How does that speak to Jesus, the omniscient bridegroom, saying, I tell you the truth, I don't know you? Yeah. And what was it that what is it that makes a person unknown to the Lord? Yep, lack of faith, unbelief, unbelief, lack of faith. And so the Lord knows those who are his. I want to make sure I don't jump ahead too much. When Jesus returns on Judgment Day, agree or disagree, he will be giving the unbelievers exactly what they were asking for. What, would you like to expound on that a little bit? They don't want to know him on earth. They don't know them. They don't want to know them. He won't know them. The Bible says that all eyes will see, all eyes will know, all kneel, and will be mm -hmm. So they will, but they still don't believe in him. Yep. And he will be giving them exactly what they wanted. They wanted nothing to do with God. And so on that day, it will be a dreaded day because the Lord Jesus will give them exactly what they wanted, nothing to do with God. And that's pictured uh, in other areas of Matthew 25 when he talks about the sheep and the goats and he talks about how um, you will be separated away from me. Yeah. That when, and when does the time of grace, when is that ending of the time of grace for a person? When, when we die or when, or when he returns, which is exactly why we have the season of Advent, because we are reminded to use our time here wisely by looking to Jesus, and that's using the time of grace wisely, looking to Jesus and serving Jesus. But when our time here on earth is over, that opportunity to know the grace of God is now over. Any other thoughts about that? Will unbelievers recognize Christ when he comes? Yes. So the, they, will, they will know at that point in time they've been wrong all their lives. Yep. And it's very sad. And, it's, and Marlene, oh, I, 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 sorry for mentioning your name for the world to hear. <laughs> but as was stated, uh, you, were, you referenced Revelation. Revelation says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And later on, that's in chapter 1, I believe, but I'm not positive. But uh, later on in Revelation, it talks about how the unbelievers will try to hide under rocks and in caves, trying to escape the coming of Christ, trying to run away from that accountability Everyone will know, and it will be a dreaded day. It will be a dreaded day for the unbelievers, but the believers are said, uh, are told, lift up your heads in joy and triumph. It is the day of your final redemption. And we understand, and every believer does, it is all by grace. We are no better than unbelievers. 
None. The only difference is what? Faith. And remember, faith, how, how did we get faith? It is a gift from God that he gave to us through word and sacrament. That faith is a gift, unearned, unasked for, unsought out. It is a gift. And we, we realize, and this is the um, awesomeness of that day. And this kind of goes back to what we talked about two weeks ago. This is why the best Christian funeral doesn't simply point to the life of the one who passed away. It points to the Savior. Because there's many unbelievers who are very nice, good people. Many. Who are kind, giving, gracious, involved in events in the world and beneficial to others. But the key is, if a person doesn't believe in Jesus, we're only in sin. It's all a gift. Any other thoughts or comments to that? Number six, let's discuss several things that might lead a Christian to lose his or her oil. What can make a Christian lose the oil? Okay, why might we become complacent? Okay. Any other thoughts on why Christians might become complacent? And, when, and I was thinking about this. This is really, I, by the way, the sermon could have been much longer because the sermon or the text, Jesus does get into that too, the not keeping watch. Complacency uh, leads to not keeping watch. It leads to an apathy, which then leads to getting tired and falling asleep. But the, um, no, I can't remember what I was going to say. The complacency comes from living by sight rather than by faith. If you think about that. Because the Apostle Paul says we live by faith, not by sight. If we try to live by sight rather than faith, then we trust in the things of the world, we find joy in the things of the world, and we find motivating drive and focus for the things of the world. And then in matters of faith, we become very complacent and apathetic. It just, if we live by sight rather than by faith, then matters of faith are not that important anymore. They just aren't. And can that happen to the Christian home? Big time. Huge. Huge. What is the key indicator if a person is becoming complacent in faith? Yep, stops hearing the word of God. Stops hearing the word of God. That is the clearest indicator of apathy of faith. Not having a desire to hear the word of God. Because that's the only way faith is fueled and fed and strengthened. Any other, which, and Carl, I'm sorry for saying your name again. <laughs> I, my instinct is taking over. But not only is a failure to hear the word of God an indicator of apathy, it is also a cause of apathy. It goes both ways. So when we stop hearing the word regularly, it causes apathy because we're not being fed, and it's also an indicator of apathy. I, I appreciated... The, well, the Wells Connection, which we did not show online, that's why we did it a little differently. We did not show that online. And if any of you want to know why, I'll tell you later. But I appreciated how it emphasized how when we gather in small groups, you keep a better eye on each other. And once we become bigger, we stop the temptation is to not be concerned about the individual in the same way. 
It just isn't, it just happens. And that's always a sad challenge when that happens because it is imperative that we keep an eye on each other. That's why the Lord wants us to gather as Christians. Uh, with COVID right now, it is really hard to keep an eye on each other. It, it really is hard. And we have to overcome that challenge and still look out for each other. Any other thoughts on what might lead to us to, or Christians to lose the oil? And keep in mind, temptation is tempting because it is, it's appealing. It's appealing. Temptation is tempting because it's appealing. If it weren't appealing, it wouldn't be a temptation. And that can happen in material things, it can happen in life, it can happen in attitude, but temptation drags people because it appeals. Any other reasons why people or Christians might lose the oil? Yeah, uh, enemies, enemies or persecution trying to prevent Christians from gathering together around the word of God and falling prey to that definitely can cause the oil to be lost. Any other? Yes, sir. And, and we pray that God remains gracious so that we live long enough to be able to look back and say, I learned. Not everybody does live long enough to be granted that wisdom, right? And that's why it's always important to be prepared today at every age. And I go back to what I was thinking about. We are tempted to live by sight rather than by faith. And think of the powerful impact that that has on a Christian attitude if we do that. Once things of the world become important, then Jesus just is not as important, period. Any other thoughts? Number seven, the Greek word used here for keep watch literally translated says keep on watching. Why do Christians today, 2,000 years later, that would be us, need this encouragement? It's been 2,000 years. <laughs> and I always, every time I think of that, I think of uh, the Apostle Peter, how God is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He's patient. He's patient. He's allowing people a time to repent. And we need to remain keeping on watching. How do we keep on watching and keep on being prepared? Yeah. And we need to, in a very practical way, make a concerted effort to have ways in our life to stay in the Word. Sometimes if we say stay in the Word, but we're not specific, that's kind of like saying, what do I got to do to get in shape? I gotta exercise. Well, yeah. <laughs> but that does us no good unless we have a daily plan for exercise, right? Whether it be walking or whatever it might be. Kind of like the same thing with staying in the Word. As Christians, we very easily say we gotta stay in the Word. Okay, yeah. How? What are we going to do? It, the, keep in mind, the Word doesn't just come to us. We have to make a focused effort to be in the Word of God. And what is the primary message of the Word of God? Jesus Christ. And the Gospel, Jesus Christ. And so that means the primary message of the Word of God is God saying to you, I love you. I want you to be in heaven. I saved you. So as we read the Word of God through that eyesight of faith, Everyone needs to be reminded that they're loved, right? And that's why we need to be reading the Word of God and hearing it. So we are reminded of how loved we are by our God, 
so we are empowered to live as people of God. For further discussion or thought or study, number eight, many people who are expecting Christ's return and who feel prepared for that return will, like the foolish virgins, be completely surprised by Jesus' words, I don't know you. Explain. How might a Christian be going through the motions of believing? Yeah, if they're reliant on their works, the things they do. Yeah. Why are you going to get it? The inher- Why are you going to get the inheritance anyway? Because of the last name, right? Because of the family name. Well, I'm going to get it anyway. How does that apply to Christianity? Do you think there's anyone who believes they're a Christian simply because their name is on a church membership roster? Does that make them a Christian? No. And so they... Do you think they're ever surprised or offended when they're asked to consider whether or not they truly are Christian? Why would they be offended by that? Because they base their comfort on the member list or their works. You see where that's going? And the point is many people think they're Christian because of how they are living, because they were confirmed, because of their background. But what is it that makes a person Christian? Does he or she believe in Jesus Christ as her Savior and his Savior? Do they believe in Jesus? Right there. Does that make sense? And this is why... In love, every congregation of believers, every family of believers must reach out to those who are straying. Because if we don't reach out to those who are straying, there can become a certain arrogance and complacency of thinking they're okay. When they're not okay. Uh, It's Jesus who makes us okay. And when a person believes, they will hunger and thirst for righteousness. Any thoughts or questions to this? When there is that doubt, what do we need? And, and even before prayer, I, I don't know if I heard it or not. I'm sorry. Yeah, we need the gospel. We need the gospel. When there is that doubt, which there always is, you're right, there always is, we need to hear the gospel. That it is God's gift. It is by grace you have been saved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. God so loved the world that he gave. Um, One of the best devotions to have in our last couple hours or days of life is to have someone sit down with us and read with us John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his only begotten son. And then we're reminded, yes, when I wrestle with doubt and wonder, can God love me? Am I part of the world? Therefore, he does, because he says he does. And that's why, that's why we have to be into the word, because we always vacillate between either arrogance and overconfidence or doubt and despair. We always bounce back and forth. We just always do. 
it's kind of easier to address the doubt part because you have the gospel to speak to it. How do you address the arrogance part? If someone's really arrogant thinking, oh, I'm fine, that's the law. That's where the law needs to be shared. Any, does that speak to the questions or thoughts? Number nine, why is it important to remember the following truth? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why do we need to remember that? And it's a promise prompted by, yep, by love, by grace. That the Lord is patient. Why? He doesn't want anyone to go where? To hell. Jesus died for all. Jesus passionately desires the salvation of people. Even more so than we. And he wants people to be in heaven. And so every day that goes by is a day of grace, an opportunity to proclaim him. How does this work with predestination? Uh, predestination or election, it does work because the doctrine of predestination is a doctrine of comfort spoken to believers not intended to be understood or figured out, but intended to comfort. It's the Lord saying to you, to me, I knew you in eternity. You belong to me. But the key is, it's intended to be appreciated and believed, not figured out. Any other thoughts or questions? Number 10, why did Jesus use a wedding banquet? rather than a business meeting as a picture of the last day. Because when, you, when there's a marriage, you're, you're becoming, you're becoming one. Like that husband and wife become one, so you're becoming one with Christ now in heaven forever. And any other reasons why he might be using the, it, it's, yeah. It's a celebration. It's a celebration. It's a bringing together and a celebration. I mean, I, <laughs> How excited would it be if you said, come to the board meeting? <laughs> but it's a, a, a celebration feast where people are uh, focused on a common joy and celebrating a common joy. It's a happy event. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read, look at a couple things to think about, something to think about as now we begin the season of Advent. I just, uh, this is Professor Deutschlander who wrote this in our um, worship planning guide heading into the season of Advent. And Professor Deutschlander just went to heaven about three weeks ago or a month ago. He passed away. He wrote several books The Theology of the Cross, The Narrow Lutheran Middle. He wrote uh, the, a two volume devotional set that I'm reading again because I, I always read it opening weekend of deer season. It tells you how many deer I'm seeing. So I'm reading my devotion books in the stand. But, um, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, Devotions on Us Challenging God. But I can't think of the name of it. But this is something he wrote about heading into the season of Advent. Those who are busy doing their own thing, serving self, looking only for the cute and entertaining things that have become such a part of the world's Christmas culture will not be ready for either his coming in grace or his coming in judgment. Make no mistake about it, he comes. He comes in grace, he comes in judgment. How then should we prepare for both comings? We do well to turn our eyes away from the glitter and the clutter of the world and focus them instead first on our need for his coming and then on his sure and certain promise to fulfill that need when he comes, we eagerly prepare by repentant watching. And um, I just thought that was a nice little reminder that what makes us ready for Christmas celebration and even more importantly, the end, 
is to get away from the stuff and focus on the substance. And the substance is Christ Jesus. It's Jesus. Any closing thoughts or questions at all? Because I have nothing more to say. Shall we close with a blessing? (laughs) The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.